I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. James Daly. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. And before I um, begin my remarks, I must declare, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I am the joint chair, the proud joint chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group for Boxing. And I believe that amateur boxing is a force for social good in this country, and that is the point and purpose of this debate. And I intend to highlight not only the fabulous work that's going on with amateur boxing clubs throughout the country, but the real social value that is being added by them. And after the historic um, events we have just been talking about, it is somewhat appropriate, I think, that my journey into boxing, Mr Deputy Speaker, began on a cold, even though I wasn't born at the time, a cold night on the 1st of March 1948, when at the King's Hall in Belfast, my great uncle, Gerald Paddy Slavin, became the heavyweight champion of Ireland. And he held that title for a number of years. He was number eight in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and that was something that inspired my late dad, Barry. Boxing was a, um, his main preoccupation, his main interest, his main passion outside of his family and his children. And it's for him that I stand here today. So if I could just put the, this issue into a national context, and I think it is right to acknowledge the great work of England boxing. And England Boxing, who've helped me in the preparation of my debate today, is, for those who don't know, the national governing body for amateur boxing within England and is one of the only sporting governing bodies with its sole focus outside and separate from the professional and unlicensed elements. England Boxing has a new strategy in place through to 2027 and has gone through rapid change, with, but with the, the support of Sport England and others it now has the opportunity to grow and build in both competitive and community delivery. With a membership of over 1,000 clubs, 25,000 competitive boxers, coaches and officials, and around 150,000 recreational boxers using clubs each week, alongside being successful in delivering medals at international championships, the sport has a significant record in delivering community programmes and activity in inner cities and local communities. So we are talking about boxing and social mobility. Boxing promotes social mobility and inclusion, positive mental health and well-being, and economic growth, and these are all key objectives as the country emerges from the pandemic and tackles the current cost of living crisis and that as the government develops its new strategy for sport, expected later this year, I'm sure from the excellent minister. Of course. Can, can, Mr. Davis, can I commend the Honourable Gentleman for Bury North and bringing this forward? Um, like uh, the Honourable Gentleman, uh, he's a very, very active boxing club. We have a very active one in, in my town of Newton Ards, and it does a number of things. And my own concern the boxing club has been helping young people to train effectively and learn to challenge their energy in an appropriate and helpful manner. And, and does the Honourable Gentleman further agree that clubs need to be funded to survive in these days when outgoings far outstrip financial incomings and the benefit to health? deserves investment. Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman very much for that um, point, which is absolutely salient to what I'm going to discuss. Funding is crucial to the work that boxing clubs throughout our United Kingdom, through every single part of it, and the work that they do in their communities. Can, these, these are clubs that are run by volunteers. They need the financial support to be able to do the work, and some of that I'm going to touch on. And if the Honourable Gentleman had more time, I'm sure he'd talk about the detailed work that club is doing in changing individual lives. And there is not many sporting organisations, professional or amateur, that can do what amateur boxing clubs do. So I thank him very much for his intervention. Of course. I, 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 I admit it to say, but I, I wish to say you know, and add in. Across Northern Ireland, uh, boxing has also done other things. It has united the two communities together. Uh, my honourable friend and colleague is, is one of those examples as well. Uh, and it's an interest in Northern Ireland that the two things we excel in is boxing and shooting. <laughs> I thank him very much for those comments. Grassroots and community boxing clubs offer so much more than just a space to train and are a vital social mobility and inclusion promoter and generator. Boxing clubs not only provide pastoral and educational support to young people and adults in need, but also help to promote social mobility, as I've discussed, inclusion, tackle criminal activity and antisocial behaviour, and deliver improvements in physical and mental well-being. 
Research published in 2020 by the Sport Industry Research Centre at Sheffield Hallam demonstrates that grassroots and community boxing clubs are well placed to support such ambitions, a crucial point. As compared to other sports, they can reach deep into diverse communities and to appeal to men and women, young people and adults. Of course, yes. Thank, thank, thank you for giving way and in doing so, uh, having been one of those people who uh, in a previous life got involved in boxing and uh, not <laughs> actually in the ring, so I must say I thoroughly enjoyed it. But, you know, in my community I have found those that have been involved in get, young people getting into boxing, it's steering them away and keeping them away from drugs and even mm -hmm. alcohol yeah. and many of them actually that discipline carries right through until they're adults and it's fantastic to see what it can achieve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I thank the honourable gentleman for that intervention and all the evidence points to that. There is evidence in every town in this country which points to exactly that point and this is why it's such an important issue. Boxing and social mobility are two things which perhaps wouldn't normally be part of a debate or go together. But what we are seeing here with real evidence, uh, empirical evidence, is the value added and how you change people's lives. Every single conversation we should have in this place is about how individual policies and groups can change individual lives. It's very difficult to think of anything that will change the lives of millions of people in one go. Boxing is doing it for thousands of people throughout this country and I thank him for that. The sport itself finds itself in a unique position when compared to others, with 40% of clubs and members located in the top 20 most deprived parts of the country and 75% in the top 50 most deprived areas. Amateur boxing clubs are quite literally in the heart of the least physically active communities in, in England. Sport England's Active Life Survey found that people from lower socioeconomic groups are the most likely to be inactive, 33%. And again, this is not about saying about making comments regarding, regarding you know, how people live their lives. It's just simply identifying the place of amateur boxing clubs. Where they are, they can make the biggest difference. Uh, and with an overwhelming majority of LSEG communities being located in the most deprived parts of the country, it becomes evident just how vital English boxing clubs really are to support young uh, people, inclusion and social mobility. It, of course, yes. Called him that uh, for giving way, and I congratulate him on this uh, debate. And just on the point about uh, inclusion and, and social mobility, um, he may be interested to know that um, in, in Warwick and Leamington we had the Turpin brothers, he, he may have heard of. Uh, the famous Turpin brothers, and of course it was uh, Dick Turpin who broke what was then called the colour bar, uh, and his brother um, Randolph who won the, the first world title for a black boxer, but that, those brothers broke through, and as a result of that, it was Asian and black sports people who now perform national, uh, na national colours uh, for our country as a result of their work. Yeah. Well, can I just say what a wonderful thing to say that is. I mean, I'm probably, I don't know, we probably share this, and my dad told me all about Randolph Turpin. We could have a lot of conversations about Don Cockle, about Brian Lund, about lots of different boxers. But what he's just pointed out is uh, a wonderful story of the ultimate tale of, of social mobility, of somebody through their passion, determination, their... Um, uh, the, both brothers are, I would recommend anybody to read about them because their achievements are immense and I thank him for that intervention. It is due to the B2022 uh, Legacy Fund that English Boxing has been able to recruit a cohort of community apprentices from these very same communities, providing them with employment, education and the opportunity to leave a legacy of their own through projects and events. And they are actively delivering to support others in the local area as well. The work they are doing is also having a lasting impact on clubs by enabling them to recruit volunteers, deliver engagement events and enable them to provide social mobility to support those in the greatest needs. Now it's only right, we've heard some of the, the wonderful examples here, that we point to some examples and I must take this opportunity, Mr Deputy Speaker, to point to uh, um, examples in my own constituency because that would only be right. And the ultimate example of this, and, and um, in my area, this man is called legendary, and he truly is in terms of what he's achieved and the impact he's had on, on lives. Berry Amateur Boxing Club was set up in 1936 by a man called Pop Jelly. His son Mick, who has been given the freedom of the borough of the Metropolitan Borough of Berry, was handed the reins 55 years ago, actually, actually longer than that, it's about 60 years ago. So Mick Jelly is a man who has been at the centre of... 
um, sporting activity in the town of Bury for 60 years. He has worked and supported and found ways to help people who have come to him in the most disadvantaged and challenging circumstances. And he's a true hero. And more heroes like Mr Jelly um, need to be identified and celebrated in this place. Um, and I just, if you'll indulge me for a second, Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I just wanted to, Mick is the ultimate example and the ultimate witness to what boxing can do. And he said, this was a comment from him in 2017, talking about his experiences, the satisfaction does not just come from watching the boys win, it is about helping them grow as people. I've seen lads become men, grow in confidence and find their place in the world. Some have come to me as school dropouts and gone on to become millionaire businessmen. These, these are stories that are reported throughout the country. Now that Berry Amateur Boxing Club has now um, uh, merged with Berry Boxing Club. Uh, and Berry, uh, sorry, forgive me, Berry Defence Academy. Um, and since that partnership uh, has uh, commenced, um, the sport in my area and the boxing club has grown. Berry Defence Academy offers seven combat sports, 400 weekly service users uh, are using the facility and is a registered charity. The sport of boxing, uh, as I say, has grown sharply in Berry. At least 100 more people are involved in boxing as a result of this partnership. It's opened up boxing to all abilities, levels, boys, girls and women and the BDA receives funding via violence reduction units. This is a boxing club being funded to address violence reduction, which is home office funding, and the Ministry of Justice Youth Sport Fund. And these funds are being used to combine sport with mentoring, volunteering, training opportunities, anti-gang speeches, uh, and various other things. Could my honourable friend give of way? Of course, of course. Uh, just, uh, just on that point, obviously in Watford we've got Anthony Joshua. I've been very, I haven't been fortunate to meet him, but I do know he has a, a, an incredible... Uh, level of work that goes into helping the community with regards charity work and so on. And there was a comment that was made to me when I was visiting uh, NRG gym recently uh, from one of the, uh, the people who works there with MMA uh, fighting. And he made the point which is that when young people learn that they can make money from fighting, they no longer want to fight for free on the streets. And it was a really powerful point about antisocial behaviour and so on. And so I just wonder if my, uh, right, my honourable friend would agree with me that this is about tackling challenges in society, but also helping with mental health, but also giving people a career and an opportunity to have a ladder up. Well, I couldn't agree more. And what my honourable friend is, and what he's proved to be during the however long, with three and a bit years now <laughs> we've been here, is that if you're a passionate advocate for your area, if you're, if you're somebody who, is, who lives and breathes and wants to support positive outcomes for your local community, there are certain outlets to do it. The boxing club that you've been talking about has been achieving that, and he certainly as an MP is doing exactly the same thing, and I congratulate him for that. I just wanted to make two further comments, Mr Deputy Speaker, regarding Mick Jelly, because I think this gets to the heart of what we're talking about. And in 2022, Mick, in a newspaper article said, I've been running a club for 60 years, there are lots of lads who came to me and said, but for you, I'd be in Strange Ways Hotel. And I think we know Strange Ways Hotel is, is a prison. Um, what we do is try to keep lads on the straight and narrow and teach them right from wrong. Some of them do go wrong, but then we try to put them back on the, on the straight path. What a, a philosophy of any organisation to have. And that's seven days a week, 365 days a year. The, the chair uh, of Berry Defence Academy, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a man called Ifti Ahmed, another wonderful, wonderful uh, human being. And he's also said, a lot of lads come here, it is a kind of refuge for them. It is a diversion that keeps them from a life of crime. We've got to think at the earliest possible stage, how do we give these guys a better life, better opportunities, and something positive to aspire to? A lot of the lads have got no money in their pocket and they struggle in employment so they get involved in drugs and gangs. If you nurture them, help them and get them fulfilling their potential through something like combat sport, it's protecting them from everything else out there. And that is what this is about. If you fund these organisations, these people who are doing it for nothing at this moment in time, think what you can do with a philosophy such as that and a record of delivery. But this... There are many other clubs throughout the country. I have to mention one of them in particular. I'm born and bred in Huddersfield. My father, who I've mentioned, was born about 10 minutes away from Ram uh, Rawthorpe um, 
amateur boxing club in Huddersfield. They've developed to become crit critical hubs in their local community by providing knife crime prevention workshops, mother and toddler classes, boxer size sessions for OAPs, and this is obviously uh, along with the traditional boxing outlets that they, um, that they offer. Um, if we go to Vulcan Amateur Boxing Club in Hull, they sought to become a food bank to feed their members in greatest need during lockdown with thanks to, uh, with thanks to funding from the Maverick Stars Trust. For many young people, the boxing club is a sanctuary from the problems they face elsewhere. It is a hub of support that instills life lessons of discipline, respect and teamwork. And again, I, I make no apologise for repeating these things. These are so important, the work that is happening. Some 63% of amateur boxing clubs in England are actively delivering community projects to try and use the sport as a hook for greater social mobility. Clubs like West Kingsdown Amateur Boxing Club in Kent, who for the past year have been delivering sessions in partnership with Parkinson's UK to help get elderly people in the area living with the disease more active, to slow the progression of the disease with thanks to funding from Sport England. That's a boxing club. If that was the NHS delivering that, we'd be, we'd be overjoyed, we'd be singing their praises. That's a boxing club doing that. Man, man, Frank, if of course, just on that point, uh, as you mentioned the NHS, I just wanted to actually uh, echo, echo thanks. During lockdown, uh, a friend of mine, Anito Donaire, who's uh, also known as a flash, a, a, a professional boxer, yeah. uh, he's won uh, titles in many different weights, he actually recorded a video for me to send to uh, nurses and doctors and staff at Watford General Hospital, um, who were Filipino, to thank them for the work they were doing. And I think what it shows is the power of boxing, the power of sport, and the power of the people within that sport to cross a, go across borders and thank people right at home where they might be not living, where they would originally have been brought up. I, I completely agree with that point. And just to develop that point, um, that the target audience of these projects are very often those who are, who are underrepresented in society, such as those targeting women and girls, which is 69% of club projects, LSEG, LSEG and crime prevention, 67%, disability and inclusion, 41%. With thanks to funding from Sport England, and I'm sure my honourable friend, the Minister, will mention Sport England because England Boxing are incredibly grateful for the funding that they have received, but they, through half a million pounds provided by the Tackling Inequalities Fund and Together Fund. English Boxing has been able to support clubs with, over the last two years, to deliver projects such as these, um, as well as ethnically diverse communities, which make up 22%, I repeat that, 22% of England uh, Boxing's members. So half a million over two years, great, and we, uh, I celebrate and thank Sport England for that funding. But we are just highlighting here that if there were the opportunity for further funding, what work could be done? England Boxing and the, th the clubs throughout the country are just waiting to be, have that potential to be released, to be able to do the work they want to do in the community. And of course, yes. I thank you for being very, very generous. And, and the funding is really important. I have a very successful gym in my constituency, one that the Turpins essentially got started. Uh, and Ed Cleary, who's running it, but he really is working uh, um, across the community. And we have two terrific young girls aged 13 and 12 who did phenomenally well in the, the Europeans, uh, 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 Jaya Kalsi and Serena Mali, and another boxer, Lewis Williams, who won the gold in the Commonwealth uh, heavyweight. But the important thing is it's run by volunteers. It's a not-for-profit. But they're, they are dependent, they do fantastic work across the community, but they do need support from the likes of Sport England, and I hope they'll get that. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for that intervention, and I, I sincerely hope that they do. We are, we're in a world where clearly um, to stand on any subject and demand unlimited resources is, is not reasonable. But I think we're always looking for those projects that have got a record of delivery. And the, the, I think some of the, one of the elixirs of politics is, the, is, the, is the, the partnership between public sector funding and uh, voluntary organisations or community organisations, because that anchor in the community is something that sometimes the state does not have, and boxing clubs deliver that. And I think he makes an excellent point. And I just very briefly, Mr Deputy Speaker, comment, uh, comment on resources. And it's just reiterating the point that the honourable friend has made. With over 95% of all clubs being run exclusively, exclusively by just two or three dedicated volunteers, the time, skill and knowledge required to capitalise on the unique and trusted position these clubs have to support disadvantaged people is often missed. Exactly the point that has just been made. 
There is rarely the time left for a voluntary coacher to set up and deliver a new project after opening the club on average of three evenings a week, then sacrificing weekends and holidays to transport and coach boxers at competitions and events before returning to maintain the gym, order new equipment or deal with club administration, usually on their own and free of charge. That's, it's, it's work throughout the year. Um, this is all taking place in buildings which are, and I think we would all agree on this, substandard facilities, with club volunteers and members alike simply making do as best they can to maintain their gyms. And in many areas, they simply cannot find appropriate places for the gyms to, uh, to have a gym in the first place. 66% of clubs have written a rental or hire agreement in place. Fewer than half of them have five years or more left on the agreement, meaning that nearly 700 amateur boxing clubs have either no security of tenure or less than five years before they potentially find themselves without a home. So it's about sustainability and um, Sport England, English boxing, club offices throughout the country are looking to work proactively with government with local councils with local mayoralties to find ways and solutions to make sure that the clubs have a sustainable future um, in conclusion mr deputy speaker um, i just bring one other i would welcome a comment from the minister in respect of one other issue and it's, it's a very serious issue because quite uniquely in this country we've seen a uh, well this is not the unique point we've seen a an, ex, well, an explosion really in white collar boxing um, and that taking place but um, England Boxing and the Government does not yet have the authority or legislation respectively in place that other, other nations have to prevent event organisers from operating outside of the rules and guidelines set by national governing bodies of amateur boxing. So can I ask, does the Department of uh, Culture, Media and Sport plan to tackle this, the issue of white collar and licensed boxing, given that they are not accountable to, uh, to EB or the national governing body or any specific uh, legislation? In terms of the other points I would raise, it is about funding, it is about facilities. Um, and uh, I know, because um, I do have a tendency to want to say when, when we have good people answering questions, the Minister is a good man, and I know that he is um, a man who will support such projects uh, in his area and throughout the country. And if there is a way to have a meeting to develop uh, a relationship between government and through English boxing, I know that he will be open to that and to find ways to, to support the great work that is being done. Um, and to finish, community boxing clubs should be front and centre, I believe, of the government's new sports strategy and levelling up policy agenda. They are a vital social mobility generator and play a unique role in supporting mobility, inclusion and regeneration in constituencies throughout the country. I, English Boxing and many others, are calling on the government to fully harness the power of grassroots and community uh, boxing, club in, boxing clubs in its new sports strategy. And, and just to finish, and we, when we look at amateur sport throughout this country, whether it is uh, sport for uh, younger people, for older people, the position of boxing clubs are unique. One can hardly go... I've seen and worked with some of the greatest um, amateur clubs and, and people involved in sport, in football, cricket and all sorts of other sports, but the work that is being done by these clubs is overlooked, is ignored... And it is a wonderful thing to be able to stand here and to celebrate every club, amateur boxing club in the country, everybody who gives their time, everyone who is working to improve the lives of just one person or 10 or 20. And I pay tribute to every single person and the work of English boxing in trying to keep everyone safe whilst all this good work is happening. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, Stuart Andrew. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm pleased to respond to this debate, and I'm extremely grateful to my honourable friend, the member for Bury North, for securing it. Um, and given his family's heritage in boxing and the honourable gentleman's experience of boxing, I'm, I'm rather anxious to get the response right uh, to this debate today, because the contributions that have been made by members across the chamber this evening show the importance that the House places on support for grassroots sport and, in particular, uh, boxing clubs. And Honourable Members have quite rightly mentioned the many volunteers and coaches that give up in a tremendous amount of time. And Frankly, much of our sporting facilities would just not exist if it were not for the people giving up of their time and, and, and sometimes their own money in support of the work that they do. And he was 
Uh, I was interested to hear about the experiences of Mr Jelly, um, but also I was pleased very recently to visit um, a, a boxing club in Bradford and see for myself the tremendous work that was going on there and the work that they were doing particularly with people perhaps sometimes felt they were overlooked in the uh, opportunities and I hope to talk more about that shortly. I think all members will agree with me that these clubs provide people wherever they may be in the country with fantastic opportunities to lead healthy lives, unlock their potential as well as make new friends in life. This government is committed to ensuring that everyone, no matter what their background, has the uh, opportunity to participate in sport. Since 2019, Sport England has invested more than £12 million into boxing to make, this, uh, to, to make this possible, including £2.3 million worth of support to boxing clubs during the COVID pandemic. Like all sports, boxing has the unique ability to unite communities and connect people who otherwise would never have crossed their paths. And the examples that we heard from colleagues from Northern Ireland, I think particularly articulated that well. Big fight nights such as December's Tyson Fury versus Derek Chisora or last October's Savannah Marshall versus Clarissa Shields create exciting moments of sporting theatre. But beyond the drama at the elite level, sport has the ability to unlock potential by giving young people essential leadership and resilient skills. And throughout this debate this evening, we've talked about the importance and contribution that they make to social mobility. And social mobility being one of my, the many areas in my portfolio is one that I'm particularly keen on because unlocking people's potential early on in life is a great thing for us to be able to do, I believe, uh, and certainly op make sure that we get the very best out of, of young people for their lives ahead. And research commissioned by Sport England shows that for every one pound that is invested in community sport, there is a return of four pound of wider social and economic value. And this is why, as a government, we are committed to ensuring everyone across the country has access to high quality provision. Last year's Active Lives survey shows that between mid-November 2020 and mid-November 21, just over six in 10 adults, 28 million, achieved 150 minutes of more activity a week. With those from the low, lower socio-economic groups and deprived areas more likely to be less active. We know that opportunities to participate in sport are not equal across the country, and this is why we are working with Sport England to provide direct support to the organisations and communities in areas that need it, need it the most. Over the past 12 months, 19.2% of Sport England's local level investment has been for projects in IMD1 areas. And we recognise that we need to maintain progress in this area. And this year, as my honourable friend alluded to, we will be publishing a new sports strategy that will set out how we will continue to support people, no matter who they are or where they are from, to enjoy the benefits of participating in sport. And for me personally, dealing with issues around communities, bringing communi uh, inclusion and bringing communities together and an emphasis on access for sport for women and girls will feature heavily in that sports strategy. This will also con uh, concentrate on addressing current disparities in participation, supporting children and young people and ensuring everyone has the facilities they need in order to be active. Helping ensure those from hard to reach communities get the opportunity to play sport is something that matters to me personally and I look forward to working with members right across this house to make sure that there is progress in this area and I see grassroots sport as being key to achieving many of those ambitions. Sport and in particular sport like boxing can also play an important role in tackling youth violence and can have a transformative impact in the prevention and early intervention work with children uh, at risk of offending behaviour. During the summer, I spent a few weeks as the prison's minister, but I was particularly struck on a visit to a young offenders institute, speaking to two individuals who sadly did not have the opportunities that perhaps we are alluding to here, and seeing that their lives now are going to be spent primarily in the criminal justice system, 
These were two particularly articulate young people, and it struck me that had they been given an alternative path to go down, it might be that we would have two individuals contributing to our society and saving our public purse a great deal of money. And that is why that last November the Ministry of Justice announced a £5 million sport fund to deliver sport for crime prevention programmes. This funding will deliver grants to around 200 local projects which deliver targeted support for children considered to be at risk of entering the justice system due to, due to identified need or additional vulnerabilities. The projects funded through the programme will build upon some of the fantastic programmes that are already being run by community boxing clubs right up and down, right up and down the country, and I thank them for that. Clubs such as, uh, schemes such as the Clink to Club programme, which provides transitional support and guidance on the benefits of boxing and mental wellbeing for inmates from Brixton to Bronzefield prisons, before they are reintegrated to their local communities and club. And now, I know a number of members have also approached me about the impact of energy bills on clubs, and my honourable friend was right to mention some of the facilities that, uh, that they are operating out of. Uh, and I recognise that this is a challenging area uh, for those clubs, and that's why we are working very closely with the sector to support them through the current challenges and with boxing clubs eligible for support under things like the Energy Bill Relief Scheme and its successor programme. Now, my honourable friend referred to white collar boxing. Um, the safety, uh, well being, and welfare of everyone taking part in sport is always absolutely paramount. Whilst there are always risks associated with participating in contact sport, it is important that robust measures are in place to reduce the risk of major injuries and health issues, and we urge all boxing event organisers to work with the sports governing bodies to ensure that robust competition standards are in place to protect the safety of those who are taking part. But I particularly understand the issues that he was talking about and his request for us to discuss this further in a meeting, which I'd be more than happy to oblige with. So, in conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, that sport has the real power to change lives. Yes, of course. Uh, I thank the Minister for his uh, comments. Uh, could I draw attention particularly to the Trin Centre in Cleethorpes and their boxing academy, overseen by Andy Cox and an excellent team of volunteers? But re returning to the issue of uh, sustainable funding for these organisations, could the Minister give an assurance that uh, he will do all he can to ensure that it's, it's actually much easier to uh, ensure continuity of funding once an, is, an initial grant has been established. So, uh, these organisations spend so much time having to complete forms uh, and uh, it's a complicated process. If he could do anything to streamline that process, it would be very welcome. Minister. Well, um, given the, before I... I, I was elected to this house, I used to work in the charity sector, I know how complex many of those forms are and how long it takes to fill them out. Uh, so it is an area that I'd be keen to look at. I have regular meetings, of course, with bodies like Sport England, so I'll be sure to arrange uh, to, to discuss that at my next meeting with them. Uh, but as I say, you know, sport has the power to change lives, and that has been e evidenced particularly well by colleagues across the house this evening, and not just through the benefits it can have on just one individual's health, but also the role that local clubs can play in fostering relationships and breaking down barriers in communities. And that is why this government is committed to ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to benefit from playing sport and physical activity. And we will continue to work to address the disparities in opportunity, both through Sport England funding and our upcoming sport strategy recognising the important role that they play in many of our, our communities. And finally, I would just say, I also want to recognise the huge contribution that many of these clubs provide in the community activity that my honourable friend alluded to. We know during the pandemic, many sporting clubs up and down the country really stood up and helped the communities in which they are based. This is a huge contribution and shows that they are more than just sporting facilities and sporting clubs. They are intrinsically in the heart of the communities in which they serve. And for that, I want to give them my thanks. And I thank all honourable members 
for their time in this important debate this evening. The question is that this House to stand adjourned. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Order, order.